Hi everyone, um, thanks for tuning in. My name is Corentin Delprat. I'm again director at Hutch and this is a talk about F1 Manager. So I'm going to talk about the journey we went on over the past two years building this game, um, going over a bit of design, a bit of business insights, and hopefully bust a few myths that I've been hearing in the industry for years now. A bit of context about myself. Um, I'm also known as Corey to people who can't pronounce my name and I've been working on free-to-play games since 2010 in my native city of Paris at a company that was still quite small at the time called Pretty Simple. Um, we were making Facebook games in Flash. That was the, the golden age of Farmville. And I moved to New York the following year working for Gameloft. We mostly developed big IP branded games like Ice Age Village, the Oregon Trail, American Settlers, Cars Hotshot Racing, and last but not least, and also my first game as a lead game designer, Spider-Man Unlimited. I ended up moving to Barcelona in 2015, working at Social Points as the lead game designer for Monster Legends. And I finally moved to London in 2016. I joined Square Enix, um, and I briefly contributed to Hitman Sniper, when they were transitioning from a, a premium to freemium model. So I, I'm gonna do a quick introduction to F1 Manager, assuming that you haven't played it. It's a light motorsport manager simulation, uh, light in the sense that we've tried and stayed away from the most spreadsheety aspects of management games to make sure it was as user-friendly as possible. What do you do in the game? Um, you have to start a fictional F1 team and build a loadout of drivers and car components that you will then carry into races against live opponents. Um, so against real players, as well as all of the official F1 teams like Ferrari, uh, Mercedes, and so on. The gameplay revolves around race strategy, which is a concept that's probably very obscure to anyone who doesn't know the sport. Um, to try and make it clearer, here's a typical view from the race. You've got two drivers that you can switch between and you don't control them. So they will drive automatically around the track. They have their own AI, um, but you can control their speed. And you can also monitor a bunch of stats about the race, like the weather forecast, um, where the other cars are, and these kind of things. The faster your drivers push, the more fuel they're gonna burn. And unfortunately, you can't refuel. So you have to be really careful not to run out. And if you go for too long without changing your tires, they'll also wear out and they'll slow you down. So that's two things you have to watch constantly, your level of fuel and the, your, your tire degradation. Of course, like any good Formula One game, you can stop at the pit to change your tires, but that will obviously make you lose precious time. The type of tires you equip will determine how fast the cars can go and how long they'll go before having to change again. The third compound you're seeing here is designed to be used in the wet exclusively. So to summarize the game, you've got that amazing tension between running faster or conserving fuel, changing your tires, equipping the right type of tires. Is it going to rain or not? And this is where F1 Manager is now in a few numbers. Um, it was released a year and a half ago and has around 350,000 daily active users on average. It's totaled over 15 million downloads and over $30 million in lifetime revenue. It hasn't always been fun in games though. We had a bumpy launch. Um, here's a chart of the lifetime revenue I was just talking about. And you can see that we went through quite a difficult patch originally where nothing was going right. And we're gonna see how to think about launching a product uh, properly and what to do when they fail. Right, so start of the journey, I started working at Hutch back in 2017. We first made a game called Hill-2, 
and it was the year when Formula One had just been acquired by a big American production company called Liberty Media. They were making efforts to rebrand the sport, re-engage their audience and open it to new potential fans. They wanted to expand the digital offering and we were, and we still are, a racing game company, so it sounded like a match made in heaven. Luckily, there was no free-to-play F1 game on the market. It sounded like a really good potential opportunity. So we started working on a high-level concept that had its roots in traditional motorsport management simulations, like Motorsport Manager, IGP Manager. Um, but there was also a bunch of really high monetizing hobbyist games um, using what we're calling now the Clash Meta game. Obviously Clash Royale was really well established at the time, but Golf Clash, 8-Ball Pool, MLB Tap Sports were all sports games in the top 100 grossing at the time um, with an exponential loot box based economy and that seemed like a really good fit, a really good promising structure for an F1 game and obviously we wanted to add a freshly rebranded F1 license on top of that. And another thing was that we wanted to be the first F1 game fully tailored for mobile by using a portrait orientation, letting players play with one thumb um, while they're commuting or whatever, and having no twitchy controls. So you only need a few inputs every minute, and that makes it really easy to multitask. So we knew it was a popular niche, but we still had a few questions. The first one being, is it too niche? Um, race strategy is quite an obscure concept, like I explained. We weren't sure if some of its notions would capture an audience big enough to, to be profitable. Um, we also knew how many fans were out there, but we didn't know their mobile gaming habits and how far their passion extended beyond the core of the real world experience. Then. The Formula One Championship has a finite content. There's a limited number of tracks, limited number of drivers, and a limited upgradability of a car or of a team that made it really difficult to develop a long-term meta game. And finally, existing games and apps that had used the Formula One license in the past had not performed amazingly well. But we still had a gut feeling that maybe these games didn't make the most of the license and the mobile platform um, and that's an assumption that we wanted validated as soon as possible because market research is nice but you also want your game to be good and to be rational um, and if it's not you don't want to spend millions before discovering it so in order to validate your assumptions rapidly you're going to want to check a few things the first one is is there a product market fit? In our case, we knew there would be a good product market fit if the prototype retained players even without a license. So that's something we could try. The second thing is what's the hardest part for players? Do they understand everything? Are they struggling with a particular concept or a particular mechanic? And in order to know that, you're going to want to show them your game and ask them questions directly. That means qualitative testing on top of your standard quantitative testing. The next thing you're going to want to check is, is the game self-contained? Is the core loop strong enough to keep players engaged despite a limited content in our case? And then finally, you're going to have to focus on one primary metric and a secondary metric. Usually the best primary metric to focus on is revenue. But if you can't test it for whatever reason, then the second best will be time related. Could be session time, could be the number of sessions per day, can be stickiness, um, it really depends on your game. Our secondary metric was cost per install. Um, so user acquisition costs, because that's the closest we could get to revenue and that's something we could use to set revenue targets for the next stage. With that in mind, we started working on a first validation build with a team of three people, myself, two client engineers, 
Um, and we spent a couple of months working on a full core loop and an early version of the Fatui. There was no monetization at all. It was clunky, totally unbranded. Actually, most of the features were, were faked. Um, we had leaderboards that looked like they had real players in them. It looked like you were playing against real players, but that was all a front. Um, we also had basic loot boxes where you could collect fictional drivers um, and car parts that would impact your stats. The whole, you know, the whole pathfinding behaviors for cars was also there. We used tracks pulled from one of our other games called Top Drives. And this crappy looking game that you're seeing and the final products actually don't perform very differently. So we released that build in March 2018. And then a second build the following month, uh, starting to implement all of the user feedback we were getting, fixing bugs, polishing a few things, trying to make the experience better. And we started realizing that we had a lot of engaged players. They were playing a lot of sessions every day, but the session time was a bit too long. It was around seven minutes, I think. Um, so we started thinking of ways to shorten that session time. And at the time, we had quite a complex qualifying flow before each race where players had to tune their car, uh, tweak a lot of really complex parameters, and then go around the track, test the best possible tire type. Um, and it felt that we could cut precious minutes from that mechanic. So we released a third and final validation build three months after the first one, where we A-B tested two different qualifying flows, uh, the original one and another one that would simulate the fastest possible lap for each player and just like streamline the entry funnel into each race. And while I'm talking about A-B testing, here's a small caveat. If you want your test to be a useful test, you're gonna to need tons of users. At the time of these validation builds, the game was out in four countries with a fairly big F1 audience. Um, let's say you want to do a three-way test in these four countries. Let's say you acquire 600 users in each country and on both iOS and Android. So that's 4,800 users in total. Um, and let's say you have a day one retention of around 30%. You're gonna get a 95% confidence interval of 2.25%. Uh, so that's getting a bit complex, but basically you're gonna need an affect size of roughly 10% in order to see anything. Um, a 10% uplift is enormous. You don't see that every day. And if you want to get that down to 5%, you're going to need over twice as many users. So that's like 11,000 users in total. That's going to be more than twice more expensive. So long story short, if your game is far away from where it needs to be, measuring small improvements is a massive waste of time. You don't want to be spending your time testing every single little thing. You need to be testing more meaningful changes because otherwise that's going to be a really time-consuming and expensive process. Okay, so back to that uh, third and final validation build. We looked at the data. We realized that the faster qualifying flow didn't really make any difference. So it meant that we could go with it, basically. And we had good metrics and we realized a few things. The first thing is that niche can actually be good. Um, we were worried of players being confused by some of the most technical stuff in the game, uh, but we realized that they know the sport, they know the rules of that sport, and they didn't need to be explained anything. They just like got it immediately. The second thing was that long session times are actually not that bad either. Um, at the time we were targeting mostly older age groups, and we now know that um, older age groups spend 75% more time each month in their favorite games and they access them twice as often as Generation Z. So not too bad. Then we realized that the stickiness was extraordinary. Um, if you don't know what that is, and I think it's the second time I'm mentioning it in this talk, it's basically the number of days when a player is active in a month. 
uh, that can indicate success that retention alone may hide. So it's a really important metric to look at in soft launch. And lastly, the day seven retention was the highest we had ever seen in a validation build. Um, so just, just so that you get a better picture of what we're talking about, um, I'm going to share with you the retention metrics we had for this third unbranded validation build. So we're talking about a day one retention of around 30% and day 30 of around 5%. Um, we had a really nice flat retention curve, which is what you're looking for really. These numbers might seem low to some of you, and that's actually quite a nice opportunity to start talking about some myths about retention I've been hearing for a long time. And that may be a bit controversial, but I think that's a really nice, healthy conversation to have in this industry. So the first myth is, why do the other companies look like they have better retention metrics than me? It may look like grass is always greener on the other side and that every single talk you're going to go to will feature crazy numbers that you can never reach. Well, um, that's not always true. Many games, especially free-to-play mobile games, are experiencing a long-term decline in active audiences. There's a lot of competition out there, but they're making more money than ever because we developers better optimize the in-game economies, the live ops, and highly engaged players continue to spend. Then another thing worth noting is that some companies actually communicate their unbound in retention. Um, if you don't know what that means, it means that there can be any number of days between um, the first day a player logs into the game and the day when they return. Uh, so that's really useful to artificially inflate your retention metrics and make them look bigger than they actually are. And it's really easy to cherry pick your best cohort and date branch. Most companies will not tell you when the data was measured or for how long. Um, if you look at F1 Manager, if we look at a cohort that joined the game in mid-September 2019, I can actually make the numbers say that we have a 41% day 30 retention, which is obviously not true. Um, so yeah, something to keep in mind when you're looking at your data, things are not always that bad. The second retention myth I'd like to talk about is also something I've heard many times, you can't increase your retention after launch. Uh, again, this is not true. Your retention will fluctuate a lot throughout the lifetime of your game. If you get featured on the Apple or the Google store, you're gonna have tons of users coming in, um, very likely lower quality users who just want to try your game, but they don't really care about it and your retention will decrease. On the opposite, if you tweak your UA and you get better quality users, or if you don't run UA at all and users find your game by themselves, so they will be self-selected, then your retention will increase. Um, so that's something to be mindful of. And you can always add small retention focused features, um, make small quality of life improvements, even if they don't have a massive impact on your retention, they can stack up to great effect and lead to a long lasting increase in retention. Here comes the last retention myth and probably the most important, the idea that day one retention is key. Day one retention is obviously important to measure the appeal of your game, but it doesn't really matter if your players churn by day 30. So many companies have this arbitrary target for day one that they have to hit, uh, but you can pull a business case out of looking at the metrics you have rather than the ones you don't have. You have to look at your genre, you have to look at the revenue compared to your company size or your team size. Um, for example, the simulation genre has a day one retention of 20% on average. Um, and your day one retention can be as low as 20% without being any cause for alarm. What you have to look at are the ratios between day one and day seven and day seven and day 30. 
If these are around 40% or higher, then you're in good shape for player retention in the long term. We don't tend to check day 30 that much in soft launch, as often the game isn't long enough or doesn't have enough content to get players engaged until day 30. But in the case of that third validation launch, we had a day one to day three ratio that was around 70% in most territories. So we had these good metrics up our sleeve. We decided that everything was good enough for the concept to be signed off, for the contract with Formula One to be signed. Um, we increased the staff to 15 people and we spent the following six months um, making the game fully server authoritative and adding monetization. Then we kept adding systems month after month um, and working on content for a still unbranded game while building an alternative version with the final assets on the side. Of course, we kept testing everything at every single stage, validating assumptions for every single feature and component until April 2019, when we finally released the first branded version with the real drivers, the real teams, the real tracks, um, the final name, and surprise, we saw a bump in revenue. So that was a really good sign, really encouraging. Um, there was a final self-launch version in the same month that only included localization. We thought we were in a good place to finally release the game worldwide. Come May 2019, we had to all the platforms. We are game of the day on the App Store. Uh, we had a massive featuring on the Google Play Store with 700,000 pre-registrations and quite a lot of press going on. We downloaded the game on our phones, we started playing it and then realized that all the cars are super jerky, uh, the game crashes all the time. Basically, despite testing all of the product assumptions, the load testing wasn't solid enough. It was our first ever live PvP game and the simulation simply couldn't meet the demand. Um, we still made it well into the UK top 100 grossing charts. We reached number one free racing game on the App Store, but we saw the number of players dropping day after day. That's obviously demoralizing and we wanted to give up everything because we thought we had, we had failed the launch and, and we could never get these users back. But little by little, we started seeing the number of users stabilizing, flattening up. Um, and that was a really good sign that, in fact, we had to trust the validation build metrics and wrestle the beast under control and actually fix everything and weather the storm. When that happens, the first thing you want to do is to be player first. You have to be honest. You have to keep your players in the loop, explain what's going on and basically ask them to trust you. Then you have to keep a low profile, um, make sure that you don't start UA, you don't start acquiring users for your game, you don't run any marketing campaign at all, just cancel everything and then keep resetting the ratings. If you have to submit a hotfix build, make sure that you use the ratings to gauge um, improvements in your products. Lastly, it may seem trivial when working on an MVP um, for a game, but make sure you have tools in place to compensate players. Like that screenshot you can see, that's the type of offers we were running regularly in the game to basically apologize to players. Then make sure you have a system to turn off the game if you want to maintain it and basically have a really good customer relationship management system. Now, let's go back to this lifetime revenue chart. We spent the following six months trying to fix the game, uh, running a few UA campaigns to try and acquire users to test the stability. These are the small spikes that you're seeing on this chart. And on the side, working on a feature called Grand Prix Events, which is a big tournament mode that's synced with the official race calendar. And that is the main live op of the game. So we did all of that until we were in a place where we felt confident that we could relaunch. And here you go, 
After crossing the valley of despair for so long, asking players to trust us, we relaunched the game. We immediately entered the top grossing charts again and we could finally be profitable and scale the game and focus on new content and features and ultimately sleep better at night. And if you look at the right hand side of these charts, you'll see that a year after the initial launch, we've actually entered a second stage of growth. So that pretty much coincides with the start of the real life season, um, which is a question we had to ask ourselves how do you deal with the change of drivers, teams, lineups, rankings from one season to the next? Traditionally, sports games would release a new title. You'd go to a store, you'd buy a new game, you'd go home and have access to the updated content. We obviously couldn't do that um, in a live game because players own different drivers and items and you have to be fair to everybody. Um, so we decided to actually annualize the whole content for everyone, which is something that you've probably seen in some of the eSports mobile games, but hasn't really been done that often in the industry. Basically, the idea is to give everybody a season score that is based on how they did throughout the year um, in various categories, like how many drivers they've collected, how many times they've leveled them up. And the higher the score, the more of a head start they'd be given next season. So for example, they could start the new season with faster timers to unlock loot boxes or fancy frames around their player portraits and skip some of the randomness from loot boxes as well. And once the season actually switches over, the progress is reset for the entire user base, which means that the team you were using until now is cemented into a legacy team you can't use as much and you have to start progressing from scratch again and collecting new drivers and new car components and going through the leagues and becoming the best again. It's incredibly nerve-wracking to release such a feature. It's risky technically, uh, but there could also be a giant community backlash, but it actually has a lot of benefits. You have to do it well. It has to feel like a relaunch. It has to come with enough fresh content to justify the reset. Then the most engaged users will get benefits for being a loyal fan. Uh, they'll be at an advantage over others. It also solves the problem of maxed out players. When you have limited content like we do, you quickly get to a point where the most hardcore players will have maxed out a few items. So that's a really good way to make sure your economy is restarted and you can also rebalance things based on learnings and data the way you wanted to do it originally or, or the way you realized things should be after a year. And finally, it creates a really interesting, long lasting lifetime value uplift because every single player who's played until now and who might have churned has now a reason to come back to the game and be competitive again and engaged again with your product. Right, so to conclude, what have we learned today? Um, the first thing is that you want to validate everything as early as you can, both qualitatively and quantitatively. Then make sure that you watch out for myths, uh, beat the superstition. Don't listen to people telling you that day one retention needs to be above a certain number or that long sessions will never work. I showed the prototype of F1 Manager to a bunch of people before we launched the game. They all told me that it would fail. It didn't fail. So yeah, here we go. Understand what good looks like in your genre and for your game. Uh, for example, it wouldn't make sense to compare F1 Manager to CSR2. They both feature cars, but they're different games. Then. If you have to weather a storm, trust your metrics. Numbers don't lie, so use them to keep you grounded. It's okay to miss your goals as long as you understand why you're missing them. And finally, launching isn't something you have one shot at. Um, in our case, we launched eight times before the worldwide launch, and we keep relaunching since with every season. And this is the end of the presentation. Thanks a lot. Hope you enjoyed the talk.
If you'd like to chat about it or ask questions, um, feel free to reach out on Twitter or LinkedIn. And until then, take care.